Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. I want to remind you guys, first of all, you have a complete show that we're giving you today, so stay with me. We have a complete show in as much as we are in fun drive. So what I'm going to ask you to do is right now go ahead and start, get those fingers together or get that finger together to go on kpft.org and support us. Please go to kpft.org and give us whatever you can. I have some offers that I'm going to tell you about in a little bit. Call 713 526 Five seven three eight. Again, that number is 713-526-5738 or go to kpft.org and support us. If you want some of these books that, that I've written about you, a lot of the subjects that we talk about on and off, folks, we have three great books for you. How to Make America Utopia. Take the economy away from those who rigged it for a kind pledge of $120. We also have It's Worth It. How to talk to your right-wing relatives, friends, and neighbors. Folks, that one is also a pledge of $120. We also have, as I see it, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom. That book as well for a pledge of $120. Folks, you can get any two books for $200, a saving of $40, or you can get all three books for $250, a great saving of $90. But folks, if you can't, Get the books or you don't want to spend that, but you want to make sure that we stay on air. Please call 713-526-5738 or go to kpft.org and select one of these options. We have the books there and all the combination of the books on the site as well. Please, folks, remember to select Politics Done Right, that your sponsor is Politics Done Right with this contribution. Anyway, folks. Welcome to another edition of Politics Done Right on KPFT 90.1 FM, Houston, your community radio station. We have a great program for you today as usual. Folks, we are in fun drive. I know you understand that. The fun drive is still going. We have to keep the station open, but we are still giving you a full show, so please stick with me. But before we get started, why not start this show early by providing some support at 713-526-5738. Again, that number is 713-526-5738. You can start by making sure we are funded. We really need your support. Again, that number is 713-526-5738. Or you can go to kpft.org and support us with whatever you can. But we will have quite a few good offers for you coming up after the introduction of the show then we'll get started folks miles taylor miles taylor former trump official he talks to me about what's happening or what's happening now that you know trump what he's doing he's going to talk about having been in the white house what he did then of course we have Kaleta harris She's going to talk to us about No Address. That's a documentary she made about the, the unhomed, the people without homes. She don't like to use the word homeless, but she's done a great documentary, and she's talking about being proactive. Anyhow, we need a sane Republican Party if we are to have a real debate of ideas. Former Trump administration official Miles Taylor is on the mission. He, along with his cohort of sane Republicans, are making an effort to save the party. In a frank interview, Miles Taylor made it clear that most of the folks who worked for Donald Trump knew that he was incompetent. He said, many saved us from Trump. 
Many of them saved us from Trump. Community activist and director-producer of the No Address documentary series, Kaleta Harris, discusses her new project to house the unsheltered. Kaleta is embarking on the next step in her project. Her idea evolved from documentary from the documentary series. The common denominator is the lack of affordable housing. Through the journey, she wanted to be a solution, and in fact, she has started a solution for the homeless. We have a very special guest today, and you guys are going to want to listen to this guy because he's one of the guys who busted the thing wide open. Miles Taylor is a public policy leader, best-selling author, and current senior fellow at the R Street Institute in Washington, D.C., where he focuses on emerging uh, technologies and public policy. Previously, Miles was Google's U.S. lead for advanced technology and security strategy, responsible for promoting next-generation cyber defense, digital security, and innovation in areas such as quantum computing, what I like, and artificial intelligence. He also served as the company's head of national security policy engagement. But in 2018, Taylor published an anonymous opinion piece in the New York Times, blowing the whistle on presidential misconduct. As anonymous, he later released the book, A Warning, a first-hand account of the instability inside President Trump's White House and administration. Miles Taylor, welcome to Politics and Right. How are you doing today? Hey, my friend, I'm doing great. I'm, I'm glad you've got me. And for folks that are watching on video, I, I'm not trying to look like Nelly. I mean, I, I would like to think I'm as good of a rapper as Nelly, but the bandaid under my eye uh, is from a less than glorious episode. Well, you said it had something to do with a puppy. I wanted to give it a better, a better thing. Like saying this, <laughs> that, that is a battle scars that you survived from all the things that you did in the past. But anyway, we want to get started in this fashion. Um, the Republican Party is in, serious, is in a serious dilemma. Look, you're on a very progressive show who wants to have a very strong conservative uh, backstop to make sure that when we put ideas together, we can get the best. We are not having that right now. And one of the things you did with your article in, first of all, let, let's, let's, let's back up. Why did you really write that article as anonymous? Yeah, look, I mean, the... Uh perspective of distance from that decision makes it all the all the more clear. Um, the big picture was that it was my opinion based on firsthand experience with the president, this White House and this administration, that the president was incredibly unfit for office. And not only that, was, was truly a danger to the fabric of our republic. Now keep in mind, again, I'm mostly a lifelong Republican. I was I was a Democrat as, as a young guy. You guys lost me uh, at a young age. <laughs> maybe you'll maybe you'll That's get fine. me back. But uh, you know I went in wanting this man to succeed, not having high expectations for a man of such deficient character as Donald Trump, but then being even more appalled than I would have expected about the way he conducted himself in office. That's the big picture reason. The immediate proximate cause, as I've told some people, was the night I wrote it. I got woken up by a phone call in the middle of the night in Australia, halfway around the world, where I was supposed to be meeting with our intelligence partners about serious threats to the country. And instead, I get a phone call from the White House Deputy Chief of Staff who says, the president wants the flags raised back up around the country. What he meant was Senator John McCain, who just passed away, was being honored across America because DHS had said, lower the flags to half mast out of respect for the late senator. Trump hated John McCain. He was so mad and he wanted the flags back up. I was so galled by that decision, I think partly because McCain had been a personal hero of mine and one of the few Republicans that I still had to look up to. And he just passed away and we were left with people like Donald Trump leading the party. Uh, and in that moment, I thought, I I'm so disgusted by this. Someone just needs to say something. All of us inside the administration, almost all of us, knew what was going on, knew the president was incompetent. Most people were trying to keep bad ideas in the box. Um, but there came a point where those efforts to keep bad ideas in the box were no longer successful. Trump just started doing what he wanted to do. And as people have often said, the guardrails came off. So I felt like someone needed to say something. And I was frustrated that the cabinet secretaries that saw the situation the same way as me weren't speaking up. Well, you're So the, I decided to write the piece. The, and it was a great piece, let me just tell you. But I, I, I always have the question when I read the piece, did anybody else lead you to do that? Did they sort of inch you on like, oh, you're the, you're the guy who has the guts to do this. So let's go ahead and see if, if you get caught well, you really don't care. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, look, I, I wish that had been the case. I mean, um, I secretly wished that the majority of the cabinet had, you know, enlisted me to write that thing on their behalf. And I happily would have been the fall guy. I mean, I, I, I wanted those people to, to make their voice known. It was quite frankly, the disappointment that those people weren't speaking up that led me to write it. And, you know, I didn't hide my name out of, out of fear or cowardice. I'm happy for people to accuse me of being a coward, but um, I wrote it without my name on it because I knew that Donald Trump was the master of the politics of personal destruction. And he uses that to distract from ideas. So the only way to get him to confront the actual ideas in my original op-ed, and the ideas being that his own team thought he was incompetent, were to, uh, was to remove my name from the equation. But my plan all along, as I later said in the book, was to reveal myself before the election because I wanted Trump to have to confront the ideas for as long as possible. But in the end game, I wanted to make clear that we all needed to unmask ourselves when it came to telling the truth about Donald Trump and shouldn't hide behind those masks. It was not terribly convenient for my personal life. Obviously, it, it caused my life to blow up, but I knew that we had to do that to send uh, that signal. So hopefully it made an impact. Uh, hopefully we convinced people of you know what Trump's character really was and, and got enough Republicans to flip their votes for Joe Biden. First of all, that is why you're on here. Not only did it make an impact, but it needs to make a further impact. That, that goes without saying. Now that said, um, uh, Miles, um, beforehand, tell us the name of your book because I want, I want to make sure people read. It's good read. Yeah, uh, the book is called A Warning. And um, I'd like to think that it hasn't completely aged now that uh, Trump has been defeated because the warning was two parts. I mean, one, it was a warning about, about a man of deficient character and why he shouldn't be reelected president. But it was also a warning about us. It was a warning about the direction that we're going as a country and as a people and the need to reflect on our national character, not just the character of one man, but the character of a nation. And, and I think that warning has still yet to be heeded. I'm grateful for all of you that heeded the first warning and, and helped get a, a truly authoritarian man out of office. But that second warning really needs to be addressed. We need some focused time and attention and soul searching as a country about where we're going, namely, Egberto, where you started the podcast, that being the Republican Party. That's where a lot of the soul searching needs to happen. And, uh, and, and I think that's where a lot of the corrosive influence our on our democracy is coming from right now. I mean, I can't believe as a Republican I'm saying this, but the GOP is quite literally at the moment one of the biggest threats to our democracy because of the Republican Party leadership's unwillingness to simply tell the truth. And what's more, party leaders like Kevin McCarthy would rather bury the truth than face it. And we just saw you know, recently his decision uh, to, to oppose uh, an inquiry into the events of January, oh, January 6th, 6th, the insurrection yeah. at the Capitol. Now, look, Miles, you knew who Donald Trump was before you went to work for him. So here's yeah. the question. Did you go to work for him because you knew we needed patriots to stand up, having a guy like that in power? Or did you go in there with the expectation that maybe he'll be an incompetent president, but he'll have good people around him? Yeah, I mean, look, what I, you know, the, the day after I started in the administration, I had a friend reach out, uh, a friend who's a, a Democrat, who said almost exactly this question, said, why are you working for this guy? Because my friend knew how I felt about Donald Trump. Of the 17 candidates in the field in 2020, he was number 17 out of 17. I did not want that man to win the White House. But I responded to my friend, I'm not going in to work for Donald Trump. I'm going in to work for you. I'm going in to work at DHS to prevent cyber attacks against our country, to protect the country from terrorist threats, man-made and natural disasters, and, and other homeland security challenges. Ironically though, managing a 250,000 person department, I had to spend most of my time managing up towards one person because he was so unstable, because he was so unwilling to focus. And, and that's really frankly, what scared me the most. And when I, Quit the administration and then I later wrote a piece in the Washington Post and said, look, my primary reason for exiting here is I think this man is actually a danger to the homeland security of the United States because Donald Trump couldn't focus on those serious threats that I went in hoping we could address and confront to defend the American people. And I actually think the country is vastly less safe as a result of his presidency. And I don't just mean in the political sense and threats to our democracy and the insurrection that happened here in the nation's capital. I mean real dangers to the country 
from people who want to do us harm, foreign adversaries, terrorists, cyber criminals. We're in greater danger because for four years, Trump largely ignored those problems and delegated them down because he was so obsessed with issues that didn't matter and so obsessed with retribution against his political enemies. Don't forget, folks, please remember, go ahead and call 713-526-5738 or go to kpft.org. Get, as I see it, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom for a kind contribution of $120. Likewise, it's worth it. How to talk to your right-wing relatives, friends, and neighbors. That as well, a contribution for $120. Likewise, how to make America utopia. Take away the economy from those who rigged it. Each of those books come with a contribution of $120, a pledge of $120. Or you can get two books for $200 or three books for $250. Folks, this is all to fund kpft.org. This is all to ensure that we can stay alive as a station. This ensures that that 100,000 watt transmitter is paid for, that we can do the things that we need to do to get the message out to you, the truthful message that you're not going to get out here. So please remember, kpft.org or 713-526-5738. Now, um, when, you, when you speak about us being in danger and you talk about it from external sources, don't you think he also awoken? I always talk about uh, using racism as a tool, okay? I, I am I'm one who actually know and believe race is a social construct and all that kind of stuff. I have no issues with race particularly. Uh, I find that the only reason I have to talk about it is because most people have yet to understand it's just a social construct. That said, don't you think he's using that deficiency within most Americans to pit us against each other and that people like yourself and specifically a young white guy like yourself have to take a more prominent position also on the racial front to kind of calm a lot of what he's starting to construct within a few young people as well. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, you know, I think we all hoped that we could get the best out of Donald Trump. I mean, any time a president's elected, whether they're from your party or not, I think the hope should be we want to get the best out of that person. Instead, we saw Donald Trump pander to our absolute worst base instincts uh, as people. And, and part of that uh, is, is the racial animus that he stoked to advance his own policies. Now, if you had said this to me in year one, and said, you know, Donald Trump's a bigot. Uh, I would have reacted reflexively and said, uh, you know, come on, that's probably not true. You can hate Republican policies and say that they're harmful to minorities, which in some cases, it, look, the party's got to reform. I mean, the party has absolutely got to be a bigger tent party. Those are valid criticisms. But to say that the man himself was a racist, I thought, you know, that's ridiculous. After two and a half years serving in that administration, I left thinking he was unquestionably a bigot because of direct experience. I mean, we had a meeting one time with Trump where he quite literally told the Secretary of Homeland Security, I wanna increase immigration from Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden. And I want you to end immigration from places like Somalia, Haiti, Ethiopia. What are the differences between those two groups right. of countries? The only thing I can really identify is uh, some of those countries, people have browner skin and the other ones, they're white blonde haired people. I mean, that to me, was the most directly bigoted comment. I couldn't believe it was coming out of his mouth, but worse than that, Egberto, I couldn't believe that there were you know, 12 other people in the room that were hearing that same thing and didn't wanna go tell the American public how disgusting this was. None of those people ever relayed that anecdote publicly as far as I'm aware, uh, but they should have. You did. Those people should have. Those people should have known better. And I did during the campaign. I mean, my whole point was, you know, people ask me, why'd you wait until the campaign? Well, quite frankly, if I'd come out against Trump the day after I left the administration in my own name, people would have stopped paying attention after a week with this news cycle. We needed them to pay attention to those anecdotes about this man's character just before they were deciding whether to rehire or fire him as president. And damn, did I want them to fire him. So yeah, that, I kept my powder dry for a little while. People can question that tactically, that's fine. But me, I'm satisfied with the decision and the outcome. Let, let me just give you some kudos here, Miles, uh, because you show an understanding of media dynamics very well. I'm, I'm telling you, I do this every day. And the truth of the matter is every story 
after it has some, some uh, age on it, has a tendency to get massaged, masticated, and placed into whoever has the dominant sphere. And in, in the case of uh, Donald Trump, he could have used that, that particular portion of his media to get the electoral majority. So you're, 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 you read it exactly right as far as knowing exactly when to release information. You know who else knows when to release information? The guy that you worked for, Donald Trump. That's the truth. He, he knows he's a, how to he's do a master it of distraction. Yeah, he's not very smart. Master of distraction. It's not very smart, but he knows how to use, he knows how to get to the carnality of people very well. Now, um, first of all, I, I am happy that, that, that you did what you did. I'm happy for, that you came out as anonymous, and I'm also happy that you came out and put a face on it, because your job was pretty important with the administration, and having somebody at your level makes a difference. Now, the party, and, and I don't know if you, can, if you can help me understand this. Is the party as gullible as we think it is, or they're using their gullibility to hide who they really are? Oh, I'm, I'm going to, if I have to pick between the two, I'm going to say the latter. And it's pretty sad to see because a lot of these members of Congress, and I won't name them, but a, a number of senators and representatives that I knew well when I worked in the House of Representatives share my same personal opinions of Trump, Trumpism, and the direction the Republican Party has gone. But so few of them have spoken up. And for the same reasons that we didn't see more people speak up from the administration, they're scared. I mean, Trump has, has instilled fear in them that not only could they lose their jobs if they come out against him, but they'll, you know, he, he and his supporters will threaten their families and will threaten their futures. And and I can attest to the fact that those are real fears. I mean, when I unmasked myself, you know, I had to leave my home. I had to leave my job. I'd, I had to hire a full-time personal security detail because of the death threats uh, and move from location to location. Now, no one's got to play the violin for me. I knew that that was going to happen. But that's the state of dissent in America today. And that's the environment that Donald Trump has fomented with his hateful rhetoric. If I'd come out against George W. Bush, who I worked for and who I admire, uh, you know, if I'd done that 20 years ago or 15 years ago, you know, people would have attacked me politically and then life would have gone on. I wouldn't have been on the run to prevent myself from getting shot. Uh, but that's, that's Donald Trump's America. That's the culture he's created. So look, I'm still a Republican. I want to reform the GOP and I'm sure we'll get into that. I'm still a Republican because of the ideas that I believe the Republican party was founded upon, because I believe the party of Lincoln saved the union. Uh, and ironically, the party of Lincoln may destroy the union now if we don't fix it. And I want to be a part of that solution. But I cannot condone someone who leads that party and leads America into danger by pitting its citizens against one another. Interestingly, let me, let me ask this before I ask the, last, the, the most important question of this um, interview. Are you, do you think people, because everybody would tell you, Donald Trump lost the Senate, the House, and the presidency. So why, is, why, why do you fear him? Is it really that you don't fear him, but you fear those who are really his sycophants that they may actually hurt people? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Liz Cheney said something that I didn't know if I would hear a member of Congress say. Um, a few days ago, she said that there were members of Congress who wanted to impeach Donald Trump after the insurrection, but didn't because they quite literally feared for their lives. You know, you don't have to take it from me, take it from Liz Cheney. I mean, she's saying her actual colleagues said they feared for their lives because they would go back home and worry that MAGA supporters would come to their house uh, because they'd shown themselves to be so violent. Now we're not talking about all MAGA supporters. We're talking about oh, sure. a small subset, a very small subset of Trump supporters that are resorting to violence to express their political views. But even that small subset of millions of people is a hell of a lot of people. And that's scary. And, uh, you know, that we're even talking about that in, a, in America's democracy is breathtaking to me. I mean, this is the type of conversation we would have uh, about a third world country, yeah. you know, trying to deal with, uh, with turmoil from one authoritarian regime to another. I mean, we're talking about the world's oldest democracy right now. If that doesn't force people to look in the mirror, quite frankly, I don't know what does. Miles, let's get to the crust now as far as you're yeah. one of the leaders in a new organization. Uh, you're intent with all these folks now to 
do what? I don't know if to ask if you're trying to take over, re retake the Republican Party, or do you want to go with a third party? What's your intent? Well, Alberto, you started off the, uh, the interview, I think, making a really important point that in our democracy, it's crucial that we have healthy opposition parties. Uh, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, I, I think it's in your interest to want the other party to have healthy discourse, open debate, and be reasonable. Because at the end of the day, to create a majority-making coalition in the United States, you pretty much have to reach across the aisle. Unless your party absolutely dominates in the election, you're going to have to reach across the aisle. So right now, even though the Democrats hold the Senate and the House and the White House, they still need Republican votes to do big things and to pass regular legislation. So we should all want the other party to be sane and rational and not secretly just root for our team and only our team. Unfortunately, right now, the GOP is sick. It is rotten to the core. And that shouldn't just be the concern of rational Republicans. It should be the concern of, of all Democrats. And I admire Joe Biden, despite the policies we may disagree on. I admire him for saying that in his first few weeks in office and saying that he himself wants a healthier Republican Party. So, look, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I wouldn't quite use the word takeover. I think what we're really trying to be is a rational insurgency within the GOP. So if you think about the Tea Party as a right-wing insurgency, we want to be the common sense insurgency that fixes the party, brings it a little bit back towards the center and back towards principled governance so that we can work across the aisle and get things done. I mean, I can't believe that the idea of just getting things done is controversial. But of course, as soon as we announced this, you know, Trump came at us, uh, you know, days ago, uh, assailing this effort. I mean, this is an effort to get people to work together and get the party back on track not an effort to alienate people who voted for Donald Trump the first time or even the second time. We want those people too to say, all right, it's time to move beyond the person and move back to the principles. And that's not just a talking point, it's quite literally what we need to do. Every single day in the news, we just talk about the person, Donald Trump, who haunts the Republican party like a specter, like a ghost that influences all of their decision-making. A person shouldn't be influencing their decision making. Their core principles should be, whether that's limited government or free minds, free markets, free people, whatever you, you want to say the GOP is about, that's what should influence its trajectory, not what one man thinks. And, and so that's what we're trying to do. And what our movement is going to undertake is an effort to try to support the sane, rational Republicans, oppose some of the radicals, and invest in what we call a deeper pro democracy bench around the country people who are really willing to defend our institutions, even if it means uh, political inconvenience. So that's our goal. We'll see if we're successful. And, and if we're not uh, successful in that and we can't reform the GOP, then, then maybe it's uh, you know, the more extreme uh, version of what you're talking about. Maybe we're you know, in Star Wars in the X-Wing fighter, you know, fight, uh, fighters you know, going into the Death Star to blow it up. I mean, <laughs> we may have to detonate the Republican Party and create something new from the rubble if it won't reform. Well, you know, um, uh, first of all, I spoke to um, Bill Crystal a few days ago, and Bill Crystal said, well, he's not a signature. He admires what uh, you guys are doing. But I think he sort of had the feeling that this was more that that the latter is what was going to be occurring as opposed to the former. I'm not sure. But um, in it, 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 it still baffles me that we we are here now. I think if I understand what you're saying, you're going to use 22 to try to bring in candidates that reflect what the GOP's tenets are supposed to be. And if that is unsuccessful, then going for 2024, you may have to take other measures. Did I, if, am I reading with, between the lines correctly? Yeah, no, I think you are. I mean, look, this is fungible in that, you know, events can really change the uh, the direction that we go. I mean, the presidential race is going to have an impact on it and, uh, you know, and how candidates do in 2022. But big picture, you've got the beats largely right, that we've got a couple of cycles here to see if we can fix the Republican Party. But if we can't, you know, we can't wait around forever and let radicalism corrupt the whole thing. I mean, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene should not be duly elected representatives of the United States Congress. Now, the, the people of Colorado have chosen her, and we hope we can convince those people, our neighbors, uh, to not do that again. But if we can't convince our brothers and sisters around this country to make smarter decisions about our representatives, then those of us who are ready to make those smarter decisions need to bind together. And that might be 
uh, through a third party. Will that hurt the GOP? Yeah, that'll probably hurt the GOP. It'll probably make it harder and steal votes away from the Republican Party. Uh, but, but quite frankly, I can't imagine supporting a GOP that allows something like January 6th to happen again. So we're going to have to monitor this clo closely. I mean, you know, really, the, the fate of our democracy is what's at stake here. And I go back to, you know, that sounds like hyperbole to some, but no, no I'm, I'm blocks from, right. from where this, yeah, I'm blocks from where this happened. I mean, I was, you know, I was standing out there as people were storming the United States Capitol in MAGA hats. I mean, I've never seen anything like it in my life. I can only imagine it was similar to the feeling of being at ground zero as the towers came down. I mean, I can only, that's the only image that I can think of that was that you know, breathtaking that happened in this country in my lifetime. Um, and, and I think they're comparable. Well, let me tell you, um, I'm, I, for the characters that are in there, uh, young admin former administration officials like yourself, older stalwarts of the party, many of them whom uh, I really have a lot of respect for, I think you guys can pull it out. Please do pull it out because those very progressive folks, very liberal folks like myself, we want to have somebody that we can actually uh, that we can actually have real debates with. I think it is important, and all the interviews that I've done on the other side of the thing that's that's the thing that I've said. And in fact, I've wrote a book called "It's Worth It: How to Talk to Your Right Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors." Because I understand something important that you're saying, and that is, if we want to accomplish big things in this country, we don't need 50 plus one. We have to have the buy-in of mm -hmm. most Americans. I know the Republican Party many times have not done that because of the way the Electoral College is set up. You really don't have to have that very much of a majority. But I think the country is happier. The country is more effective if we can actually have that. And I, I commend what you and your courts are doing because I think if it's not done, I'm from Central America, Panama. I know what it looks like. Most mm -hmm. Americans don't. I know what this, I know, I saw this for what it really was. I saw January 6th for what it really was. So what you're doing is hero's work and very important. So I commend you on that. Chief of Staff to the United States Secretary of Homeland Security, Miles Taylor, who also is anonymous from that viral New York Times article and the author of Anonymous, a warning, Anonymous. Uh, give me a closer statement. Hey, well, I appreciate it, my friend. Some days, I, some days I wake up wishing I was still anonymous. <laughs> but, uh, but look, you know, you made you made such a fantastic point at the end here. And I always tell people, uh, as much as they want to complain about Washington D.C. being broken, Washington is not what's broken. The founders designed a system very well that was meant to reflect the attitudes of the populace. Washington's not broken. We are broken. We are broken, and this come this goes down to the door to door grassroots level. That's why your book is important. That's why others' statements that we need to come together uh, across partisan lines in our communities are so important because that's really what's going to get us out of this mess. As insipid as it sounds, reaching across the aisles in our own houses and not in the U.S. House of Representatives is where this is going to start. So I hope people really take that to heart, and, and I'm grateful that you're spreading that message. Miles Taylor, it was my pleasure to have you on board. My friend, thank you so much. Don't forget, folks, please remember, go ahead and call 713-526-5738 or go to kpft.org. Get, as I see it, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom for a kind contribution of $120. Likewise, it's worth it. How to talk to your right-wing relatives, friends, and neighbors. That as well, a contribution for $120. Likewise, how to make America utopia. Take away the economy from those who rigged it. Each of those books come with a contribution of $120, a pledge of $120, or you can get two books for $200 or three books for $250. Folks, this is all to fund kpft.org. This is all to ensure that we can stay alive as a station. This ensures that that 100,000 watt transmitter is paid for, that we can do the things that we need to do to get the message out to you, the truthful message that you're not going to get out here. So please remember, kpft.org or 713-526-5738. Three, eight.
Today we have a special guest. This woman is doing something new that it's dear to my heart. It should be dear to us all. Kalita Harris is the owner of Real to Real Productions. She received a vis uh, vision to start her own production company while attending the University of South Carolina. She is a producer director of the documentary series entitled No Address, which depicts the criminalization of homelessness and how communities across the country can implement proven practical solutions to this growing epidemic. Her other credits include script su supervisor and editor for a drama series entitled The Hard Pass and producer for the 1960s film Through Her Eyes, which has won various awards in the film market. Kalita, welcome aboard Politics and Right. Greetings. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be back on your program. Look, let me tell you, I'm excited to have you because I tell you something. I got an email and um, a GoFundMe email for this thing. And then before I realized it was coming from you, I was like, wow, great concept. I'm like, wait, that is Kalita. That's putting this together. I mean, you've, you've gone throughout this country. You have done a lot of interviews with, you don't call them the homeless. Tell me what you call them. The unsheltered. Why do you do that? Because homeless has such a stigma to it. When you think homeless, you think, Ugh, you know, it's right. like you're not even a part of society. You're just, you know, something that's not human. So the unsheltered is just people without homes. And that can include anyone. And, you know, from our first interview, that was one of the concepts that most stuck to me when mm -hmm. you started to when you started to really give a meaning to what the condition really was what society has done to people. Homelessness, you, as you said, is dreadful. Unsheltered means something that has to be fixed. Yes. And, you know, and, and I really, really enjoyed that. Now, before we get into your new project, tell me a little bit about your successes with um, the No Address. Successes with No Address. I'm just excited that the Columbia series version has just taken off. We were in six virtual theaters across the country. Now we're down to two because their run has, has gone. It was like a 30 day to 60 day run, but they have done so well. Great feedback from the community. People want to get involved. Like what's the change? So that's why I created this foundation because I, if people are looking to me for answers or to want to help, I need to be able to provide them with something because I can't just say, hey, go to your continuum of cares or go to, you know, your city council person because you're just going to get the runaround. So it's going to take us to be the change we want to see. So I want to be able to create that platform for someone to say, hey, I want to get involved and then show them the next steps to get involved. So now I am creating. Wait, the wait, 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 wait. I don't want you to go to the creating yet. We we're going to. <laughs> there where okay. what i want you to do is tell our audience what uh, a little bit about no address though what it is that you did that gives you that uh that gives you now the gravitas to do what you are going to be doing in this new project because uh, you know i see uh kalita a whole lot of um foundations and i see a lot of nonprofits, and they go out and do things right they're, they're good at heart. They know what they want to do and they see things on the external and they know what they want to do. Mm -hmm. What I love about the project that you're doing is you went and in, engaged yourself with these people. You, you became a part of these people as you did what? Tell us a little bit about No Address. So No Address, for the people that do not know, it's I started back in 2013. So this was a seven year project. It became my life, you know? So I was in my downtown office and I read in the newspaper that Columbia City Council wanted to do something about their homeless issue. And it was appalling when I read it because they had three options. And one was just to leave town, go to a shelter on the outskirts of town or be subject to arrest if you're caught on the streets. And these ordinances are just like loitering, panhandling, sitting on a bench, lying on a bench, you know, just things where they just don't want your face to be seen or they want to keep the beautification of these business districts, you know. So 
I was like, well, I have a production company. I was doing more marketing videos, live events, things like that. And I said, well, I have all the tools. Let me go ahead and start documenting what's around me. And that's how it started. I would communicate with these humans all the time because most people, you know, congregate downtown. And I don't look at human beings as their situation. You know what I mean? It's how you treat me, how we treat each other. So I was, I'm an empath. So I'm like, what if that were me? And I had to leave town and I had to disappear. Where would I go if I had nowhere to go? You know what I mean? And don't just tell me to go to a shelter when I should be able to have that option, you know? So that's when I started documenting this and I just connected with these beautiful spirits. Like someone said, like these probably are our ancestors from other, you know, dimensions <laughs> coming back to this planet, you know? So I'm like, you treat people the way you want to be treated. So I have really like, a, some of them have, you know, left this planet and I was there in the hospital room when they did. So I made a strong connection with these people. And now I'm like, their voices need to be heard on so many levels. So it was just, it started in South Carolina. Then I went to North Carolina. Then I went to LA, then Atlanta. So it is just it's blossomed into this documentary, you know, and now I am doing Atlanta. So the goal is to have that done by the end of this year. And then I'm gonna put it down and focus on the future and the vision that's been given to me. And your vision, as I understand it, starts with uh, this foundation that you're starting to fund via GoFundMe. And like I said, when I saw that, it was like, great. She's taking it. And I didn't know it was you at first <laughs> until I said, wait, Kalita, oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. It's you're taking it to the next level. In other words, you've learned a lot and you yes. decided to, do something you know we always talk about uh, those of us that do a lot of talking right what kind of actions that uh, are, are we going to put against that and i you know when i'm being introspective i do the same what am i okay i do a lot of talking we do a lot of talking how do we actually make that fundamental difference in people's lives for the things that we talk about that we know need to get done you're doing that you are doing that and i think that is so so Important. So I am here to talk about the ultimate goal, which is to obtain land to build sustainable communities for the unsheltered. So what does that look like? That looks like all of this. It can be one acre, two acres, five acres, 50 acres. It doesn't matter. We can just build on the land whatever we want. And that is affordable, sustainable living, which can be tiny homes, container homes, steel homes. We want to have wraparound services, all of these things on the land to provide for those that are without homes. And it doesn't make sense that millions of Americans do not have shelter or food. So we wanna add agriculture and organic farming to the land as well for self-sustainability. So no one has to worry about getting a job anymore. We can have entrepreneurs making money through agriculture. So we wanna create all of this on the land and we need your support. We need your donations. We need your organizations, even the people boots on the ground. We wanna provide that foundation for you all. So let's collaborate. And it's gonna take us to be the change that we wanna see. So please tell me your project uh, that, that, that you're funding right now. So I was like you with the nonprofits. I don't know if I want to go that route. I don't know. You know, I just want to, you know, just make connections and create some change within the policies that are going on. Because a lot of people, you know, unless you're a big organization, address this issue on, you know, on a political scale, if you will. So I've tried. I have spoke with <laughs> council people. I have spoke with that. But it's just the dead end. It's not going anywhere. So I'm like. Well, how can I tell people to get involved <laughs> with politics when it's not going anywhere? And I, like I say, it's been a century, <laughs> over a century to get this right. And now something has to be done. Something different has to be done or just something has to be done. I don't even know if anything has really been done. You know, it's more of a band-aid that people are doing. So right now, housing is a human right. And I feel like what we're going to create with the No Address Foundation is villages. We want to have villages for the unsheltered. At first, when I used to talk about this, you know, I had critics and like, oh, 
you can't just put people there. You, you're isolating them or you're going to do this or you're going to do that. And now you see all of these communities are popping up doing the same thing. So, you know, it takes one to do it and then everybody will jump on board, right? So I am creating this village. I had the vision to have like still homes or tiny homes or container homes, whichever one, you know, just for self-sustainability because still homes and container homes can withstand hurricane five. I mean, category five hurricanes. So I want to have land. That's the first step is getting the land. So it can be an acre, five acres, 50 acres, whatever. You can donate the land if you'd like. But my goal, I've already picked out the land where I want it and everything. So I'm raising funds to get the land. And then on top of that, put the housing, then have wraparound services, medical clinics, you know, then agriculture on top of that. So people can actually become entrepreneurs through agriculture. So you don't have to beg for a job because you're going to be self-sustainable with food and capital. And also like carpentry, all of the domestic type jobs that aren't really being fulfilled anymore. But a lot of the unsheltered have those skills when it comes to it, because half, I would say in Colombia, a lot of those Columbia, South Carolina, a lot of those buildings were done by the unsheltered through day labor programs and things. So they're putting their work. So if you didn't have them, you wouldn't have this infrastructure, you know? So I say, let me take all of your skills and we're going to build on this land, whatever we want. You know, so I want I'm calling on nonprofits, grassroots organizations that want to sit at the table that keep begging to be at the table on the boardrooms and having these conversations. Forget about that. I want to be like, hey, you come to our table and you can provide all of your resources right there on the land. So that's my goal is to start in Colombia and then wherever the universe takes it, I'm willing to go. Well, you know, I, I think it's a great idea. You know, I just got to write in my book, um, How to Make America Utopia. And yes. the, yeah, I'm, and, but the thing about it, it's, it's it, it, what I, I'm calling it the unfinished book, right? And mm -hmm. the reason why is I think I'm going to attach it to a site where we can learn from people like you. In other words, I, I, I've, I expressed the, the, po the, the political environment that have things screwed up as they are today and some solutions that government can provide. And what I like about your solution is you are also providing, um, not to absolve the government from what they must do, but you're also providing a solution uh, that's coming from, we are going to use our blood, sweat and tears to do something and not lift ourselves up by our bootstraps. That's a silly statement that we've learned to say, but mm -hmm. actually together, build something that is ours that isn't that isn't something that was afforded us you know so i i, I love what you're doing and um I, I want and i hope that by us giving exposure to you by whatever other exposure you can get that that can come to fruition because i would like nothing more than to uh, either fly up to georgia or get on my bike and do a uh, you know, a cycle into Georgia and see your community as you build it out there and show people that, you know what, many people care and this can be done. Yes. And through these platforms, and I give thanks for you, like people are starting to come together. I'm connecting with some beautiful humans that are on the same mission, you know? So I'm like, let's not try to do everything individually. Let's collaborate because you know, <laughs> we can get things done. <laughs> and not only that, you use you use the best out of everybody. Like I said, um, you know, I read your document. The first the first thing I did was, like I told you, I, the, the first time we spoke, I learned about the difference in homelessness and the unsheltered. You know, you know, th there are certain things that when it hits you, you never forget, right? <laughs> and that was like, oh, okay, that is how we need. That's the viewpoint that we need to have on that. And, you know, moving on, learning from your experiences that you show in your video, what these, a lot of these people could be us. So right. many people don't realize that. And let's talk about this, the moratoriums. Oh, the God. Moratorium. Tell, tell America about that, because what happens is people don't, under, people think, oh, we're recovered. Right. They don't understand that a lot of people that even right now are employed, 
they are in dire straits. Explain, explain the moratorium, uh, the, uh, the moratorium to them. So the moratoriums was enacted, federal moratoriums were enacted in March of 2020. So let's imagine if someone did not pay their rent April of 2020, they can still stay in their homes, but it's been documented when the moratoriums are lifted, you have to pay all that back. And then that's when the court cases start, you know? So you're looking at a year and a half worth of, you know, that can be $10,000, $20,000 that people owe if they had if they lost their job and couldn't pay for anything, only just food, clothing, you know? So now last week, no, not last week. Yes, last week they had lifted the moratoriums because they said it's unconstitutional. The CDC had these moratoriums. It wasn't right. federal anymore. But now the DOJ, the Department of Justice is appealing it. I think so, that the, the judge put a stay on the order. So it, we're still a little bit okay. We're still there. So they're appealing it. So you still have to go through the process. So they'll probably go into court next week. But now there, there are 18 states that have their own moratoriums. So they're kind of protected, you know, those states. And it's really just the big states. So a lot of these smaller states aren't they may have to, they're starting the eviction process. So now they're projecting about 40%. If everything goes the way they're going, they're projecting 40% of people being unsheltered. That's amazing. So what is America really going to look like? So that's why I say no, stop the judgment. Stop all of this. Bring awareness to this issue because it can be your friend, your cousin, your neighbor at this point. Then now you may want to have a voice and say, oh, this is just not right. This is so inhumane. And this is, yeah. And then a lot of those people that may end up on the streets don't know about the criminalization laws, right? And these ordinances that what they do, if they even sleep in their car, they can get arrested or get a citation. So it's all about educating first. And I say the solution to that is just do a clean slate, wipe out all of it from the banks to the tenant, start over. You know what I mean? And, you know, you know, a lot of people don't understand an economic system isn't divine. It was created by man. And notice I said it created by man. And yes. I really mean literally man. So we, yes. we, 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 if, if we had systems created by more folk, including women, et cetera, the economic system would look completely different than what we have today. Kalita, please tell our audience how they can be a part of your project, a project that is well deserving of everyone's support. Well, you can get involved. You can contact me at noaddressdocumentary.com. I made the site where you can have everything on there. You could see the GoFundMe page, donate get people involved, watch the documentary. Like I said, there's two more theaters that we're screening at. One is the Colonial Theater and one is the Guild Theater. And one's New Mexico and I believe California. Okay. <laughs> so many of them. Right. But after that, we're going to keep it on the site anyway, just as a hub to have a home for the documentary. So just to get involved, donate, listen to the podcast, you know, just educate yourself, have articles there, even other interviews. So it's a one-stop hub. So go to noaddressdocumentary.com. And then you can also follow us on our social media. IG is noaddressdoc, D-O-C. And Facebook is noaddressdocuseries. Even if you have to remember all that stuff, you don't have to worry because it will all be in the blog posts that goes along with this uh, particular program, you'll be on today. Look, let me tell you, Kalita, you are uh, an inspiration for what you're doing. Please continue doing what you're doing and please stay in touch and let us know how we can be of further assistance to your project. Folks, we're, we've just spoken to Kalita Harris, the owner of Real to Real Production and the director producer of... No Edges Documentary Series. And let me tell you, thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Thank you so much. And I will, when we break ground, we'll do another interview. Absolutely so. All right. Thank you. Don't forget, folks, please remember, go ahead and call 713-526-5738 
or go to kpft.org. Get As I See It, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom for a kind contribution of $120. Likewise, it's worth it. How to talk to your right-wing relatives, friends, and neighbors. That as well, a contribution for $120. Likewise, how to make America utopia. Take away the economy from those who rigged it. Each of those books come with a contribution of $120, a pledge of $120, or you can get two books for $200 or three books for $250. Folks, this is all to fund kpft.org. This is all to ensure that we can stay alive as a station. This ensures that that 100,000 watt transmitter is paid for, that we can do the things that we need to do to get the message out to you, the truthful message that you're not going to get out here. So please remember, kpft.org or 713-526-5738. Eight. Please remember, keep your community radio station, KPFT, in your minds. Talk about it. Tell your friends to tune in to 90.1 FM Houston or listen to kpft.org. Keep us on air by donating what you can afford at our website, kpft.org. Once again, remember, you can get politics done right Mondays through Fridays on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash politics done right or on YouTube, live at politicsdoneright.com slash YouTube. And remember, remember, you can follow me at on Twitter, Egberto Willis, at Egberto Willis, spelled E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. Look, folks, I know you could have been anywhere else, but you're here with us. Thank you so kindly. We here at KPFT are honored to have you. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right, and you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out! Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right.